Bonjour à tous et bienvenue à notre webinaire Québec Océan. Donc aujourd'hui, nous sommes heureux d'accueillir Cédric Fichot, qui est assistant professeur à l'Université de Boston au Department of Earth and Environment depuis 2016. Cédric est titulaire d'une maîtrise en océanographie chimique à l'Université de Dalhousie, d'un doctorat en sciences marines de l'Université de Caroline du Sud et il a réalisé un postdoc dans le, labo, le Jet Propulsion Laboratory en Californie. Dans son laboratoire, on se spécialise sur l'utilisation de l'optique et de la télédétection pour faciliter les études des complexes biogéochimiques et des interactions géophysiques entre les systèmes aquatiques et terrestres. En particulier, on se focalise dans son laboratoire sur l'impact du climat et des changements induits par l'homme sur la biogéochimie, la qualité de l'eau, les propriétés optiques et la géomorphologie des environnements côtiers. Donc maintenant, je vais céder la parole à Cédric. Thanks a lot for uh, the invitation. Thanks, Christian, for inviting me. Uh, so today, I'm going to present uh, something that's a little bit uh, kind of a uh, side work from, um, you know, adjacent work from what I typically do. Um, so what I typically do is, is I use uh, aquatic optics and remote sensing to uh, uh, Primarily, I try to understand uh, the cycling of this organic matter along the land ocean continuum. So, this uh, look at seagrasses and the use of optics for seagrasses is a little bit of a kind of a new angle for me. Um, so, um, by no means, I am a, a seagrass, uh, seagrass ecologist, so I'm kind of really getting into this field. So, if any of you work on seagrasses uh, in particular, I definitely welcome um, any feedback or any criticism that, that you may have. So what I'm going to be talking about today is really uh, uh, looking at how we can use and uh, modeled, uh, modeled irradiances to try to provide better information to understand seagrass habitat suitability in a, in a mesotidal estuary, uh, in a local estuary that's kind of pretty close here from, from Boston. So before I start, um, I'd like to acknowledge that a lot of the work I'm going to be showing you today is, is the work of Olivia here, was another graduate student in my in my lab for, for the past two years. She graduated last May and then I hired her for a few months to kind of essentially complete this work. So her and I have been working uh, very closely on, 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 uh, on this work and the modeling aspect of this work. Um, I've also worked uh, in collaboration here with Alison Novak. Okay, so she's really the person who knows a lot more about seagrass than I do uh, on this project. And uh, I've been learning a lot from her. Um, and, uh, but also I'd like to recognize that a lot of the work that I'm going to show you today has really been a, a kind of a, a lab-wide effort uh, uh, from all my different graduate students, my lab tech. Uh, we've been all, part all participating in, in the field work and, and the labor laboratory analysis. Also been working a little bit with Inke, uh, who is a researcher at the Marine Biological Lab at, at Woods Hole and uh, for which, with which you know, I've, been, I've been using some of our data. All right, so um, I've been uh, starting to get interested in, in, in seagrasses because they are particularly important, also because Alisa is in, is in the department and, and my student Olivia has been interested in working on this. Um, but they are very important. They are uh, distribu distributed worldwide, okay, all the way from the interdital zone all the way to about a 90 meter depth for some species and in some conditions where the waters are, are particularly clear. Um, they're very important because they provide a wide range of ecosystem services, uh, go ranging from uh, shoreline stabilization, they essentially trap sediment and uh, uh, help stabilize the, the, the shoreline. They, um, they limit erosion, they uh, represent a uh, very important uh, ecosystem in the sense that they provide habitats for a number of, um, of species, they represent a food source for uh, a number of other uh, large mammals like manatees, for example, dugongs. Um, and uh, they are also uh, extremely important because they're an important contributor to oceanic blue carbon. Okay, so meaning that they, uh, through uh, their growth, they essentially uh, help sequester a lot of uh, organic carbon. I think there's distribution of seagrasses worldwide, which you can see here on this map, which you know spans a lot, you know, essentially all of the continents except Antarctica and, and a wide range of uh, latitudes. Uh, represent about 0.2% uh, of the ocean surface, but they contribute to 20% of the uh, 
uh, oceanic blue carbon uh, sequestration. So unfortunately, these systems uh, are very important and also one uh, some of the, more, the, the world's most uh, threatened ecosystems. Okay, and so in, uh, since over the past several decades, we've lost about uh, uh, several you know, thousand of square kilometers of, of uh, seagrass meadows uh, uh, worldwide. So the region I'm going to be focusing on today is, uh, is uh, the temperate North Atlantic bioregion, okay, which is located right here, it's this kind of green area, which is the century that spans the eastern side of North America, as well as uh, Northern Europe, Western, no Northwestern Europe. Um, and it's an environment where uh, there's, you know, it's largely dominated by, uh, by eelgrass, the eelgrass is just terra marina, which you, you can see a picture here. Um, and um, this is typically you'll find these in, in estuaries in lagoons or kind of all around the coast. Uh, I know some of you uh, work in, in uh, James Bay up, uh, up here in Quebec, um, and uh, you also find them kind of some of the species over there. Um, so this species that um, used to be fairly abundant here, on, on particularly on the East Coast, uh, but we've lost about 50% of all seagrass habitat on, on the U.S. East Coast over, over the past century. Part of that was due to uh, the seagrass wasting disease, okay, which was caused by marine protists that causing those lesion infection uh, of the blades, um, and that has essentially wiped out. Um, if I remember correctly, about 90% of uh, old sea grasses um, in, this, in, in this region in Europe and, 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 uh, and the East Coast here, uh, in the 1930s. And so there's been some recovery, but there's about 50% of the sea grasses still been lost over the past, uh, uh, the past century. So it's, uh, there's also you know, the continuous threat to the ecosystem from, uh, from changes in water quality along the coast, eutrophication, like increased turbidity, erosion, and tends to affect the uh, clarity of the water and changes in water temperature as well. All these you know, are contributing to uh, their general decline. So one of the, the regions where we've uh, lost uh, essentially all the seagrasses over, over the past centuries is the Plum Island estuary. So the Plum, Plum Island estuary is a, is a fairly small estuary about you know, 15 kilometer long uh, here in northern Massachusetts, so just about 40 minute, 40, 40, kilo, 40 uh, minute drive from uh, from Boston University, so just looking slightly north of here. Um, it's a it's a bar built uh, tidal marsh influence estuary. It's a very dynamic system and very turgenous, as I'm going to describe. That's fed by a couple of rivers, the Parker and the Ipswich. Um, it's you know surrounded by a marsh, primarily high marsh. Uh, and uh, it's got an, essentially a barrier island um, right here. Uh, it's also an LTR site. So for those of you who are not familiar, it's a long-term ecological research. It's a network of uh, sites around, primarily around the US, uh, that, uh, where there's a long-term ecological uh, study. So a bunch of scientists are funded by NSF to work uh, uh, the long-term monitoring and, and, and study of these systems. So this is one of them. And so we're kind of very lucky to have this uh, very close to home here. So this is a system where they used to harbor uh, significant uh, acres of uh, eelgrass meadows um, that have been lost in the middle of the 1900s. So the uh, exact causes for the losses for, for these particular seagrasses is not uh, entirely clear. A lot of the records of seagrasses have been lost in the fire at some point, but through research, uh, Alisa, my, my collaborator, has been uh, be able to find some historical uh, location uh, sites of, of seagrasses from talking to f local fishermen and, and going kind of essentially in the library and finding some records there. But it's a little bit, this aspect is a little bit obscure um, about what happened to them. But there's been a lot of, uh, lot of interest in, in, in uh, restoring seagrasses, seagrass meadows in this environment. And Alyssa has been working, uh, you know, starting 2013, I believe, uh, on trying to kind of uh, uh, restore seagrasses over there. And uh, so what she's been doing, she's been uh, uh, bringing some transplants and essentially planting, uh, making some transplants of seagrasses and try to see if they eventually kind of take root and, and eventually kind of grow into, uh, into a, a sizable meadow. And um, so she's been doing that on a number of sites here all around the estuary. So 
One thing that is very important when you do this restoration effort is the site selection. So site selection is, is going to be considered one of the most important factor in determining the transplant success. So uh, depending on where you know you put it, it's, you might have a very different outcome. You want to have really the optimal conditions so these plants can can grow uh, effectively and, and uh, uh, have, you know you have a, end up being a successful restoration uh, restoration uh, site. So the way uh, she's been selecting these sites is by uh, building those habitat suitability uh, maps, essentially these areas where we think the conditions, the combination of conditions are, are suitable for, for the growth. And here's a map I guess she can generate in 2014 that helped her kind of select, select those sites. Um, so the way she's been doing this, uh, it's kind of interesting as well. Uh, in some ways a little bit uh, simplistic and could use some, some improvement. Um, and it's by combining information about uh, the location, for example, of interdive flats, uh, bathymetry, something about the water depth, about the sediment type, some information about the water quality, the presence of mooring fields. Usually you don't want to put your, uh, your new kind of transplant in areas where people are mooring and, and putting their anchors. And also some information, you know, fairly crude information here about water clarity. As you can see, right, there's, there's a pretty uh, crude kind of division of, of the estuary in, in, in uh, average water quality that she got, I think, from um, some, some sensor, some measurements uh, that we made in those uh, parts of the estuary. So fairly, fairly simplistic. So the thing is, that at the end of the day, when she uh, she did all these restoration sites, there was a fairly you know mixed restoration success. Only a couple of sites ended up being successful. So a lot of them just didn't take, you know, did not didn't last, didn't last very long. And one one of the sites that was particularly kind of surprising was uh, Nelson's Island, where it was one that was maybe less expected uh, from her first guesses, from her first map to, to be successful there. And here's a map, uh, just a, um, sorry, an image of a uh, photo of the, of the sites. And you can see here it's actually out of the water because occasionally this, this area gets exposed, exposed to hair when you're during the springtime. Uh, it's also an area where the, the, the water clarity was not, ex you know, didn't, was not expected to be as high. So uh, she didn't expect to, this, the site to be successful. So there's clearly something that we don't, understand perfectly well. So, and the, the idea, really, the, the motivation, I guess, for this work is, you know, can we, can we do better here? Uh, can, we do, can we improve on these habitats of team map and maybe improve the success of some of these restoration sites? And so we'll try to kind of use uh, optics, you know, some basic optics here uh, to the rescue uh, to do this because solar exposure at the end, the solar exposure of the seagrasses is, is one of the most important a determinant of habitat suitability because uh, you know uh, these uh, these seagrasses have a fairly high light requirement, so they'll need they'll need a certain uh, level of exposure in order to kind of be able to sustain uh, to sustain growth. Uh, they have this big root system that they need they need uh, they need to fuel, and um, they uh, they're also going to be sensitive to uh, some of the UV uh, the UV exposure. So you want a little bit of UVB, but you don't want too much. Uh, and um, so it does, um, I think the best way to get, to get an idea of the suitability of the system is to get a good handle on uh, the solar exposure. Not only just the magnitude of the irradiance, but also get some information about the spectral characteristics, how much UV, just how much uh, visible light, and also maybe getting a sense of, of the variability in, in the system. And that can be more complicated in some system than others. And so the idea here of what the, the question that we're trying to answer here is can we better inform seagrass habitat suitability uh, models or maps okay, by, by quantifying the, the benthic solar exposure in a, in a dynamic system like, like the permanent estuary. Okay, so as, as I'm about to show you, it's a, very, it's a very dynamic system. It's an estuary, but it's also entirely given um, estuary. So that's what kind of we try to do. And, uh, it's kind of a little bit of still of a work in progress at this point, uh, but I think the answer to this is, is yes, we can, we can improve those. There's still some, some work to do and still some improvements to make, but um, I think we've been able to uh, provide some, some useful information. So the Plumman this year again is located in, you know, in, in northern Massachusetts. Um, again, it's about, you know, here is about you know, one to two kilometer uh, wide. Uh, it's about 15 kilometer long, so not, not a very large estuary. Uh, 
uh, it's influenced by salt marshes. Okay, so it's a high marsh, meaning it's a marsh that gets that gets uh, flooded uh, only really during the very the very strong tide, uh, during high, uh, spring tide, in particular. Um, it's a fairly shallow system overall. Most of the estuary is, tends to be under uh, 10 to 10 to 12 meter depth. There's certain areas here in the southern part of the estuary that's going to be a little deeper, um, but most of the estuary is relatively shallow. Uh, very tidally driven system, semi diurnal tides with an amplitude about three meters uh, on average. You know, that can reach up to close to four meters during the spring tide, as you can see here in this. Uh, essentially, this, this year uh, changes in water level. Uh, so it's a very well mixed system overall, and it's it's a relatively clear. It's a system that has relatively clear water for for near steering. Uh, it's got fairly moderate levels of uh, suspended sediment concentration. Typically, you know things that concentration that go, might range from one to ten. Typically, in, in in the main part of the estuary, it can go higher in some of the channels. Uh, so, uh, really to make this clear, and you know, there's a system that for the, the waters will look like this, like, like this photo of Plumine and Estuary here, not a system that looks like an estuary in, in Louisiana. You know? That makes sense, you know, because it's an area where you can have, have seagrasses that can go. So, so um, the idea here was to try to um, really calculate uh, benthic spectral irradiances in a, in a system that dynamic like this. And, um, here we're kind of going at the kind of essentially the simplest quantity that we can get at this point, uh, which is the irradiance that's reaching the seafloor. So spectrally, like right, a spectrum of, of irradiance, of downwelling irradiance reaching, reaching the seafloor. And uh, if you want to know that at any point right in the estuary, um, the way you can get at it and in its most simplest way, in its simplest way is, is by uh, be able to know uh, the irradiance that's reaching just below the air water interface, essentially just in the interface above or below, uh, doesn't, doesn't matter here. Um, you need to get a sense of what is the water depth. Okay? For a system like this, it's going to be changing uh, very rapidly and, and all the time. And you'll get a, you need to get a, a sense of what's the attenuation of the light in, in, the, in the water column. So essentially those three kind of variables that you need to be able to constrain uh, in this system to be able to uh, to do something. So uh, as a reminder here, right, in this system like this, like the Permanestory, these three variables are going to be varying on, on time scales of tens and tens of meters and tens of minutes. Uh, so it's a very, very uh, heterogeneous and very uh, dynamic system. So uh, for a system like this, uh, uh, we can actually constrain the water depth relatively easily, uh, not perfectly, but easily. If you get a sense of the bathymetry, and we have a good bathymetry uh, of this environment, LIDAR bathymetry that was done a few years ago, and that gives us a good sense uh, of what's, what's the bathymetry at, at sea level, sorry. Um, and uh, if you get, get an idea what's the water level, which you can get from a NOAA tide gauge, it's located in the southern part of the estuary here. You can get for any moment, uh, any point in time, you can get a, a sense of what what is the water depth in the estuary. And here, I do understand, you know, there's some there's some delay between the the, the, tunnel, the water level here and the water level as far in the northern part of the estuary. But um, there's, you know, for its most simplest uh, modeling effort here, we can consider this uh, kind of the same over the estuary. So we can constrain the water depth to to, to some degree. Um, the downwelling irradiance that's reaching the surface is also something we can constrain relatively well through modeling. Okay, and something we've been doing here in this uh, in this system um, for uh, using uh, using a radiative transfer model uh, and other uh, input information uh, uh, from uh, remotely 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 sensed information. Uh, so what we've been doing here is actually uh, uh, quantifying or modeling the uh, downwelling irradiance. Early uh, and estimates of cloud, cor cloud corrected spectral uh, spectral irradiance. So what we've been doing for this, so we've been using uh, inputs of solar zenith angle, Earth's sun's distance, and other atmospheric parameters such as atmospheric pressure, uh, absorption by gases uh, such as ozone, uh, nitrogen dioxide, sulfur dioxide, um, and aerosol optical depth. These are information you can either get from remotely sense uh, remote sensing information or uh, or, uh, or from kind of the local stations. Um, that's what kind of we've been using here. 
Uh, we use this as an input to the red, to, uh, relative transfer model, which is the star model in particular, which is the system for the transmission of uh, atmospheric radiation, um, which is a model that's particularly uh, optimized for, uh, for the UV region. And that allowed us to calculate uh, clear sky downwelling irradiance. Okay, so uh, irradiance will have if we assume the conditions where, uh, where, clear, where clear sky uh, for different atmospheric pressure and gases, but the clear sky. And uh, we've been using uh, MODIS, uh, so remotely sense cloud optical thickness, and, and use those to derive um, estimates of transmittance, cloud transmittance, to provide some first order correction for, for the presence of clouds. And we've been able to kind of use this to model uh, essentially hourly irradiance uh, over the plumbine and the estuary. Kind of the center of the estuary, assuming it's, it's relatively con it's constant over, over the entire estuary. So here, zooming in on a month, you can see you know, how things vary from day to day, depending on the cloud cover. And we have, of course, information on, on hourly basis and spectrally. Okay, so it's essentially that uh, spec the spectral and temporal, temporal dimension here. So in order to see how well we're doing with this, we, we did some comparison to uh, uh, institute measurements of, uh, of irradiance as made with a PAR sensor on one of the platforms of the Edi, uh, Ediflux uh, tower that uh, is maintained by Inke. Inke is a, is a scientist who studied the uh, carbon exchange between the marsh and marsh in the atmosphere. So she has those, uh, those towers here uh, that measure CO2, CO2 fluxes and uh, she has a power sensor on, uh, on this. So that's providing, provided us with uh, ways to actually compare how our model was doing. And um, of course, here we're just integrating, we're looking at the whole part, the photosynthetically active uh, radiation range, so the visible range. Uh, but what, what it's been showing us is that we've been doing a pretty decent job at, at, at modeling the irradiance uh, over this area. And it's always hard to try to reproduce e exactly what's happening at one particular sensor because the effects of cloud air can be very kind of more local. Um, but overall, we're doing, you know, we're doing pretty well. Sometimes we do extremely well. Sometimes we do not, not as well. But overall, we're able to reproduce you know, the, main, the main, impacts of, main impacts of the clouds. Uh, looking a little more you know, uh, in terms of daily integrated uh, power measurements for, for a three-year period, Overall, we're able to reproduce the, you know, I think the, the major uh, variations in the in the uh, in the irradiance uh, for all three years, and really comparing the measurements uh, for this uh, for this time period, we've able to do pretty well. And if when you compare the error of, over time, you can see that the you know the error in general tends to be normally distributed around around kind of a mean of zero, meaning that uh, when we actually integrate or average over time, it, a lot of the error tends, tends to cancel out. And uh, actually on a yearly basis, those, those irradiance measurements really match within, within a percent or so. So again, you know, this, is not, uh, this was not validating uh, over, the UV, uh, over the UV region, but it was um, uh, providing us with a, a kind of a, at least a good benchmark to say that, that it's working. So the, uh, the more kind of a more challenging aspect of this was to try to predict uh, the attenuation in the water column at every point in, in the estuary. So that's where kind of most of our work kind of focused on. And, and um, so we've been uh, trying to develop a statistical approach to be able to determine KD from some simple variables such as distance, uh, such as location in the estuary, uh, the tidal, uh, tidal water level, as well as, well as discharge. So in order to be able to develop those models, we've been um, kind of going out in the field, doing some field work, and, and acquiring a bunch of measurements of light attenuation in, in the water column, as well as collecting samples. Um, there's something, uh, this was you know, part of an effort where uh, taking the students out in the field, kind of training them into the techniques, and also a teacher class here occasionally every other year. Um, it's a field uh, research-oriented class that gives us the opportunity to get, get a lot more data. So we've been uh, um, acquiring data at about 116 station, uh, stations over a period about roughly about three years from 2017 to 2020. And um, we've had uh, been collecting these, these measurements uh, over a period uh, between May and, and May and November, essentially. So we don't have 
as many uh, data over over the winter time. But we're going to separate that data set into a training and, and, a, and a validation kind of data set. So what we've been doing at these stations, essentially uh, uh, deploy this profiler here. Uh, it's an optical instrument that has essentially an irradiant sensor that collects irradiance as a function of depth, and that allows you to get a sense and estimate of the attenuation of the light uh, in the water column. And it does this at 18 different wavelengths, all the way from the UVB out in, in, the, in the red part of the spectrum. So that allowed us to calculate or estimate a, a spectra of, of, uh, of uh, attenuation coefficient uh, in the waters at every single one of these stations. Every one of these stations also collected in serial information, such as salinity, temperature, turbidity, to kind of give us uh, information about the, uh, the water quality and the, the salinity in particular. And we've been collecting samples to measure the absorption, look at the absorption by uh, seed down and, and, and particles. All right, so the, in, terms of, uh, in terms of the data, what's uh, uh, showing here is the variability in the, in the spectral diffuse attenuation coefficient. We've uh, essentially making the point here that we, uh, there's a lot of variability in, in the attenuation, uh, a lot of variability in particular in the UV part of the spectrum uh, with you know, vari values uh, varying over a couple of orders of magnitude. And uh, something that is very kind of reminiscent of the effects here of uh, chromophoric dissolved organic matter. Um, in particular. So not as much variability in the, in the right part of the spectrum. All of this being consistent with uh, chromophoric dissolved organic matter being a, a, kind of an important uh, a primary kind of uh, uh, influencer of the, of the attenuation of the water column. So that's something that was confirmed when we compared um, the diffuse attenuation coefficient to the absorption coefficient of CDON for all these, uh, or essentially all these samples, all different wavelengths. And what you can see here is that you know, there's a very strong linear relationship between the two indicative uh, that this is a, a, dominant, uh, a dominant source of viability in, in the attenuation in, the, in, the, in this system, particularly you know, if, all the way even into, into the green part of the spectrum. So um, uh, this is kind of something that's confirmed here by uh, looking at really the, the contribution of the absorption coefficient to uh, to the total absorption by uh, by all different constituents, really showing again uh, here being shown representing 100%, meaning the total absorption. Really, the, the sedum really contributing to most of the absorption and, and uh, uh, in uh, these wavelengths all the way even into the, the green part of the spectrum. Even with the absorption of particles, algal and non algal including the tritos net, uh, not being uh, you know uh, reaching these these levels of uh, of contribution. So essentially, again, just to uh, confirm that this is a system really that, uh, you know, it's consistent with the system uh, being, being looking like this and, and not uh, looking like that. But the main point here is that the dominance of CDOM and the optical properties and the attenuation of this, of this system is that it, in many ways it simplifies the dynamics of, of the diffuse attenuation because it's, it's the primary viable, the primary constituent here that's going to influence uh, the attenuation, which will make it easy to, to predict. So in terms of predicting uh, the diffuse attenuation uh, coefficient in a system like this, um, one of the first uh, variables that we can use to get, get a sense of, uh, of its value in a system like that is, is really the distance to the end members. You know, if CDOM is the primary contributor to the attenuation um, and CDOM has uh, its main source from rivers and, and, and the marshes, um, we can you know, logically expect that when you're closer to the end member, you have, you have a higher CDOM than you have uh, closer to the, uh, to, to the mass of the estuary. And sure enough, when you, when you compare all your data and you compare that to a distance uh, of your uh, particular station to the actual end member, right, to the, to, uh, for these green triangles, the distance from you know, our furthest point in the, in the river here, uh, or uh, from the furthest point in the in the in the creek here for for those uh, uh, purple circles, um, we see a, a general relationship between the two. So it's something kind of you can expect for for a system like this. But what it tells you is that you know having knowledge of the distance of of your point from the end member gives you already a handle like some some ways to predict and predict to the the KD. Um, another thing that's uh, going to be particularly important um, is the, the tidal variations in the in, in the water level. Okay, so if you were to do the measurements at a particular spot here in, in in part of the estuary, if you look 
uh, during a whole tidal cycle, which we did here during September 2019, um, over a period of 12 hours where the water level is going down, you are through tide and at high tide, again, with salinity following a similar pattern, um, you would see the seed arm again increase when, when the way to a maximum point where it's low tide and then it's kind of decreasing again. So it's like tide tidal pumping of this organic matter and uh, optically active constituents from, from the marsh out or from the river out into, um, into the estuary. Uh, very briefly here, just also you can expect the river discharge uh, will have some influence on the KD of the estuary. The bigger the discharge, uh, typically the more material you have with it. Here's, uh, I don't have data from a time series from this particular river in our system, uh, but I'm showing you here is kind of an example from Arctic rivers, where the higher the discharge, the more disorganic carbon and more sedum as a result you tend to have. So this, this tend to be some relationship between the two. Um, and it, it, it's fair to expect that if you have a higher discharge, you'll have some, some more material, more sedum and, and a greater attenuation in the system. So just again, mentioning here that um, these different variables can be used in a very simple, a very simple uh, uh, model statistical model to predict the light attenuation from those different variables, um, including your distance from the end member, your river discharge, uh, your water level. And uh, we also included here, we, you know, through testing, testing of the system of the, of the model, um, the rate of change in the water level also proved to be, uh, to have, you know, to be useful. Um, and the expectation is that when you have a, a very fast uh, rate of change in the water level, meaning when the currents are really, the, the tides are really receding very quickly or, or coming in very quickly, uh, you tend to have a greater chance of suspension, maybe uh, 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 changing the attenuation due to other consequences like particles. So it's just all a kind of an empirical approach, but there's some logical um, reason behind using these different variables there. And um, at the end of the day, you know, we've played a lot in terms of tuning, tuning the model, but uh, at the end of the day, we were able to, uh, we're pretty happy with, with the results in, in of this very simple model. Uh, and we're able to predict, you know, KD, uh, KD within, uh, I think it's 20 or 30, 30 percent uncertainty uh, on average for, for the system. So that's, that's from the training data and for all the different wavelengths from the UVB all the way to the red part of the spectrum. Um, and overall kind of the model, the model works, works pretty well. Uh, we've used, uh, you know, these were the data that were used to uh, parameterize the model. We also used the model to uh, validate them, uh, the model using an independent data set. And just to show you here, that also seemed uh, working pretty uh, reasonably well. Okay, there's a few areas, maybe at the very low end, uh, that we tend to have some some overestimation, but um, it takes time to acquire a number of a number of stations like this. So uh, we're a little bit limited in number of data points, but overall seems to be working pretty well. Um, when we implement the model, so you can see that it's a model that retrieves uh, spectrally coherent uh, KD. So these are not measured; they're modeled at different point for average average conditions, average tidal level, average discharge. Um, and you can see in general the spectrum, you know, kind of, they make sense spectrally, even though each wavelength was parameterized independently. So what we've done here now is uh, just like we implemented the, uh, the irradiance model, we implemented this model uh, uh, for three years and uh, here hourly. And uh, I'm showing you results for only three of the stations uh, along the estuary and Essentially, you can see the, the variability, the variability in the in the KD, both spatially for those three different points, but also temporarily as a function of the tides, and also as a function of the of the, uh, uh, of the discharge. Essentially, so all these variations kind of make sense, are inconsistent, and within the range of what we'd expect. There's no the model was kind of parameterized; it, it doesn't completely go out of whack with certain uh, with certain you know uh, measurements of discharge or anything. So it's pretty pretty well constrained and pretty fairly happy with that. We have, um, just to show you a little bit uh, more like a, a spatial view of the, of the, of the products, uh, the attenuation here um, were modeled uh, for, you know, uh, two different, uh, uh, two different tidal level and two different dates to show you kind of a case of a high tide, high discharge, low tide, high, dis uh, high discharge. 
and, and the different spectra at those different locations. Just going to show you a bit what the implementation looks like. What, what this means, like essentially we have a map of the KD like this for every hour for that period. So again, you know, consistent, relatively consistent result. Um, so at the end of the day, we've, you know, we have our water depth from uh, simple bathymetry and water level measurements. We have our modeled irradiances, we have our modeled uh, diffuse attenuation coefficients. And the idea was now to kind of implement and average this over a three year period from 2017 to 2019. Um, at the time we're starting to do this when we had the three years we had completed. Um, and uh, the idea was to try to produce a kind of average uh, benthic downwelling, uh, downwelling irradiance product uh, for uh, the UVB, the UVA, and, and, and the visible range to get a sense of you know what what essentially the seagrass would be experiencing at this depth. Okay, on average over the three-year time period. So these are these are kind of variables that now we would like to include and incorporate in those um, uh, habitat suitability uh, suitability models, and um, the way. The kind of information from you know from my understanding of uh, all the seagrass ecology is like the information typically the way people determine suitable conditions in terms of light uh, for seagrass is in terms of the fraction of the incident surface irradiance that is reaching the seafloor. So here we're presenting uh, essentially the same same kind of type of information but in terms of the fraction of the light that was uh, in, uh, that is reaching the seafloor relative to that that was incident at, at the surface. Um, and based on uh, information from a uh, mesocosm study uh, that have been, uh, been done for, for eel grass, um, it's been determined that typically the optimal, optimal growth conditions for seagrasses is when they're exposed to at least 34% of the surface light level. Um, it's been determined that they're, they're able to survive from 14 to 34%. And that typically when they have less than 14% 14, 14 of surface light level, it's unsuitable. So the, the actual, you know, these criteria uh, pretty need some kind of some refinement and uh, more net, you know, determination, better determination is in natural settings. But uh, this is kind of what we're able to go, uh, go with uh, for the moment. And again, this is still a bit of work in progress and we're still working on trying to refine a little bit these criteria. But, I think that's where we're reaching a little bit in the limit of what we know in terms of the ecology and the effects, you know, the, the connection between exposure and really uh, uh, kind of uh, survival rates. Um, so we've uh, tried to kind of make use of the, the new UV info, UVB information that, that we have here. Um, and this is something that's for which the threshold, thresholds are still very unclear. Uh, my understanding from talking to Alyssa is that, uh, you know, the, so seagrasses at least need a little bit of UVB to uh, to grow optimally, but you know too much UVB is becomes an issue and uh, can can be uh, can be detrimental. So there's still a bit of a, a, of improvements to make uh, to make here in terms of these criteria. But um, here we've been using uh, low, very low level, or no, essentially less than one percent of uh, UVB as being uh, less suitable, and a little more UVB being a little more suitable. Um, but it's, you know, recognize here that, that this is something that really needs to be, it's a little bit arbitrary and it needs to be, it needs to be improved. And the way we've been trying to also improve uh, the, the suitability model is by sort of just looking at areas where you have, um, you have into the R flat is, is more calculating the fraction of the time that the seafloor is exposed to air uh, during daytime, which is when uh, the seagrass spray are most vulnerable to uh, to UV, and so we've been trying to, you know, through discussion with Lisa, trying to kind of come up with some of those criteria. And swear we still have difficulties in, in figuring out those exact criteria. But uh, we've been determining those areas where uh, you have optimal growth, where you have less than three percent of daytime uh, being exposed to air, and areas where you have three to ten percent. What you can have. Um, uh, still things that are surviving, like at this particular site. So ET and mooring is also being a couple of factors that can, can into play, but the idea is that we generated those new uh, habitat uh, uh, suitability maps for, for, for this area uh, based on uh, the use or not use of UVB 
and to try to really refine these areas where we have the most suitable site using using those model irradiances. And um, so at this point, you know, we we just generated this map very very recently. There's still some improvements that still need to be made. There's still a bit of work in progress, but uh, the you know the expectation here is to maybe next summer or this summer to be able to use some of these uh, improved map to uh, to guide the next restoration site for for Lisa and, and we'll see how that's we're going to see how these sites are are, are doing. So uh, for those of you who do optics, you're probably just going to wondering why I have not uh, even. Uh, considered scalar radiance uh, for something like this um, so. One of the things is going to be, and we haven't included in there, we really went very simple in terms of, of trying to quantify the irradiance uh, reaching the seafloor. We have not really considered how the, the, the seagrass blades themselves will be collecting the light. And that's something that's likely to be uh, quite important, have some influence on, on the levels of light, uh, the levels of irradiance that, that, that we need, we need to, to uh, quantify. Because sometimes whether the blades are completely underwater or whether they're right at the surface when the water level is very low and the seagrass is essentially kind of flat at the surface, or whether you are at slack tide and the seagrasses are you know, standing straight up or when you have a strong current, uh, these are you know, likely, they're gonna, they're gonna matter in terms of the light that's collected by the seagrasses. So it's something we have not kind of considered or kind of incorporated in this model, but it's something that we we'll need to do and try to parameterize in function of the, you know, in terms of the current and Maybe the blade length and the water level. So something that's a lot more complicated and might require some more sophisticated modeling. But something that's it's in our mind. The, the other things we have not considered also in those restoration criteria is, is the presence of uh, those uh, European green crabs. Okay, they tend to be they've been present now for the past few years uh, at Permian and Estuary, and they tend to be pretty bad for especially the new transplants. As soon as you know those are put in there, uh, they tend to kind of go and, and really decrease their chance of survival. So that's that's another consideration. Um, and uh, another thing we have, haven't talked about, but it's an important criteria, is the maximum uh, tidal beer, uh, bed <laughs> shear stress. Um, and it's it's really, uh, in this is a result of a model from one of my colleagues here at BU, who does this kind of hydrodynamic model. And uh, when, when the tides are going pretty strong here, when you're in the middle of the tide, middle of uh, a flood tide or heptide, the, the currents are really reaping in this part of the, of the estuary. So uh, when you have very strong current and strong uh, bottom shear stress here, um, this can, you know, for new transplant, it can be a problem because they can be really, really uh, uh, pulled away uh, and it can decrease their chance of survival. So this part of the estuary might be a little less suitable uh, as well for restoration. So it's something kind of to consider. Uh, but we don't have a very good idea of what's an appropriate, appropriate threshold for, uh, for, for a new transplant. So that's something that Alicia is actually trying to determine right now. All right, so we're uh, going uh, too much longer here. So in terms of conclusion, um, I think we've, through this exercise, we've demonstrated you know, the feasibility of improving seagrass habitat suitability maps okay, for, for dynamic system through, through this kind of a relatively simple modeling. Um, it's not perfect, uh, still a work in progress. There's, there's, there's room, room to improve uh, our estimate um, through you know, better training and validation of the, the KD models. Um, we need to do more validation of the, of the UV irradiances for, for the system and the model of the irradiances. Um, there's also uh, you know, clearly a need to better concern how the seagrass blades gonna collect the light and understanding really how you know, going from that plain irradiance that we model to something that's actually more realistic in terms of, uh, of uh, the sunlight collection by the seagrass blades. Um, I think what one of the main things that I've realized you know, when, when doing this also is that there's really a need to better understand uh, the threshold for solar exposure for seagrass and kind of understanding really what are the right light levels, uh, especially in the UV domain and looking at the uh, combination of all these uh, different uh, Different uh, optical domains on on, on the seagrasses, um, and I think I think there needs to be you know, a lot more studies and that to help us kind of make full use of of these of these data that we modeled. And uh, I think overall, you know, this model is going to also have some applicability beyond uh, the plumbing and estuary of seagrasses. I mean, the similar approaches that could be uh, could be developed, trained with uh, local data uh in other systems so you know the, this general idea maybe for other series could be could be applied there but 
uh, very likely you'll have to train it with with a local data set. Um, and uh, I think you know this this potential application of so for for uh, sediment biogeochemistry if you're interested in looking at the effects of sunlight there uh, on on the sediment. And I think yeah, I think that's what I have. If you have any questions. Yeah, merci beaucoup Cédric pour cette très belle présentation. Euh, je vais commencer euh, par une question euh, tout d'abord de Brigitte Robineau. Euh, donc, la question de Brigitte, « Do you think further study should consider storm impacts supposed to happen more frequently with the climate changing? » Yeah, I mean, this is definitely another uh, factor that could have some, some impact. It's a little bit of a sheltered system here because it's inside the estuary, but uh, there's definitely a strong wind events, especially during low tide, would have definitely some impact on these uh, Yeah, this side, so it's, yeah, it's a very good, very good idea. Something we'll do probably, probably with my colleague uh, Sergio. Uh, I'd be, uh... Merci. Uh, Simon Bélanger. Oui, euh, salut Cédric, merci pour euh, la présentation, super intéressant. En fait, euh, c'est un peu frustrant dans, dans la littérature, justement, de Seagrass, parce que toujours les light requirements, c'est toujours en, en pourcentage, puis on, on sait très bien que. Euh, Lorsqu'on va dans le nord, euh, on peut même avoir un pourcentage X, mais ça ne sera pas applicable dans le sud. Hein? Donc, euh, donc tu as, as mentionné ça. Est-ce que c'est quoi la, la stratégie que vous avez avec les biologistes pour déterminer ces fameux euh, euh, seuils de lumière minimum là, pour euh, déterminer un, un habitat? J'ai eu les mêmes discussions bon, un, un peu frustrantes. Alissa you know, aussi a euh, les, euh, les, mêmes, les mêmes problèmes. Aussi, bon, beaucoup qui mesurent ça aussi en l'humain. Les, 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 euh, les, les mesures sont faites aussi avec différents euh, sensors. On fait des fois en, en mesocons. <rire> Il y, a, il y a un disconnect là qu'il qu qu faudrait euh, essayer de régler. Je pense qu'il faudrait faire des expériences en faisant l'optique correctement. Euh, et donc là, c est, c est, bon, je pense que c'était à part dans la présentation, c'est là où bon, c'est un peu difficile quoi, de, 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 de trouver les bons, les bons thresholds. Et mm. Je pense que nous, ce qu'on va essayer de faire, c'est plus euh, au niveau du, du Massachusetts euh, en entier, j'espère peut-être faire un peu plus de travail là-dessus. Hein. C'est assez nouveau comme travail hein, pour moi. Là. Euh, c'est de, de, de regarder aux, aux endroits qui, où il y a eu du succès et d'essayer de, 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 de modéliser ou avec, la, ou avec la télédétection ou à partir de modèles comme ça, de pouvoir essayer de voir les, les conditions et puis de, de, de comparer les endroits où il y a les, les, les sites de restauration ont du succès avec les, les, les taux, les, les mesures d'irradiance euh, qu'on qu estime. Donc, il y, a, ouais, il y a encore pas mal de travail là-dessus. C'est bon, ce que j'ai bien réalisé en en me plongeant un peu dans, dans ce domaine. Donc, euh, si je peux te retourner un peu la question au niveau du, euh, de, la, de la James Bay, euh, qu'est-ce que vous... Qu est quelle est votre stratégie là-bas? La stratégie euh, pour déterminer, c est, c est, je dirais que c'est plus avec les, les biologistes qu'on doit euh, travailler. Puis euh, sur ça, euh, j'ai déjà posé la question à, à Fanny euh, Noisette, qui est peut-être en ligne, qui pourrait peut-être apporter un élément de réponse. Fanny, je crois qu'elle fait des incubations, euh, ou elle fait des mesures sur, sur le terrain euh, qui, qui peuvent certainement aider, mais euh, euh, je ne suis pas... Euh, la stratégie n'est pas si claire que ça pour, pour nous non plus, pour déterminer mmh. ces, fameux, ces fameux seuils. Mmh. Je suis en ligne. Salut, Simon. Bonjour, Cédric. On ne se connaît pas. Bonjour. Euh, oui, nous, euh, bah, en fait, on essaie déjà de déterminer l'efficacité photosynthétique euh, en fonction de la lumière. Donc, on fait des courbes de production éclairement. Et euh, ça nous permet de voir si déjà, est-ce que les, les plantes sont capables de fonctionner à des très faibles intensités ou est-ce qu'il leur en faut beaucoup plus et, euh, et l'idée, c'est aussi de voir si ça évolue dans le temps, parce que le problème qu'on a avec les mésocosmes, c'est qu'on n'a pas forcément toujours la même réponse, que ça s'alimente en fonction du temps. Et donc, on travaille aussi à différents niveaux lumineux. Et au cours du temps, on répète les mêmes mesures pour voir si on a des phénomènes d'acclimatation. Ça, ça nous permet de savoir déjà à quelle, quelle lumière elles sont capables de, de fonctionner okay. et de grandir. Parce que ça peut fonctionner, mais ça ne peut pas grandir des fois. Est-ce qu'on connaissait un peu plus les effets des, des UV, non? Est-ce que vous regardez les effets des UV là-dedans? Moi, je ne regarde pas du tout ça pour l'instant. 
Ce sera peut-être une piste à explorer pour plus tard. Euh, on avait une question de Carlos. Yes. Uh, hello, Cédric. Thanks for your presentation. Yes. Uh, my question is regarding the, you mentioned that CDON is the primary IOP effect on determining KD, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, regarding your end members, uh, my question is if you could see differences in the photochemical or molecular wave used in the slope between your different end members, and if yes, or how would you expect that this to affect the KD in terms of uh, chemical properties of the sedum? So I've, um, I, so there's there's two differences between so the the two main members I was showing there was the the river itself the Parker River and then there's the marsh uh, as well and. Um, what we've seen is in general the marsh at a higher DOC, uh, high, higher DOC levels. And in terms of the slope, there was also some some differences, slightly slower slope in there, uh, in, in the in the marsh influence uh, river. So in the so let me go back. So in, in this in this Raleigh River here, okay, we tend which is mo mostly dominated by essentially a marsh. Okay, the, this river is this one is actually a river. This one is called Raleigh River, but essentially a tidal creek. Um, and uh, so there, there's definitely some differences in terms of the optical properties. It's not it's not very strong and not very easy to uh, to, uh, to to differentiate in terms of the relationship between CDOM and KD. And as you can see, question here. Um, in terms in terms of the CDOM again, you know, I'm not exploring the, the slope at 275 to 95, but the relationship between CDOM and, and KD here is pretty is pretty similar. Right. Across, so this is data from from both uh, no, from everywhere. So there's not there's not a very clear difference in terms of uh, the relationship between CDOM and KD in those. Uh, but there's the slight difference in the slope. There's a slight difference. It's not not very very strong. Bien, nous avons une question aussi dans le chat de Maxime Benoît Gagné. Would it make a difference to consider the upwelling irradiance diffusing back from the seafloor? En fait, je me de, je me demandais. Euh, si ça fait une, une différence, si on considérait aussi les photons qui diffusent depuis le fond marin, c'est-à-dire qui en quelque sorte rebondissent sur le fond marin. Sur le fond marin, sur les, sur les plantes. En fait, oui, euh, oui. Alors, il y aura certainement une différence, surtout sur des fonds qui seraient un peu plus blancs. Je ne pas, pas peux pas donner une estimation, là, ça pourrait être fait en modélisation. Euh, et oui, on pourrait peut-être euh, s'attendre à une petite différence, oui, quand même. Euh, quelle est la couleur du fond marin à, à cet endroit-là? Ça dépend où. La réflectance euh, du, du fond marin, ça, je crois qu'elle varie environ de peu près de, euh, une vingtaine de pourcents au nord, plus euh, vers 50 euh, quand même euh, plus au bas, plus, plus au sud, euh, plus au sud de, de l'estuaire. Donc, c'est une transition plus de, entre euh, plus, tiens, plus fin, plus organique euh, euh, à la, à la bouche, à la, proche de la rivière, euh, à quelque chose qui est plus sableux, un petit peu plus sableux, euh, euh, à l'embouchure de l'estuaire. Donc c'est certainement une considération, c'est une limitation de... de, 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 de... Okay, on n'a pas, pas inclus ça euh, euh, dedans, mais bon, en faisant des petits... Ça va, ça va vraiment dépendre du niveau, du niveau de l'eau, euh, euh, ça, ça va dépendre du, de, de l'irradiance qui, qui est reçue euh, au fond. Et ensuite, qui va, qui va être réfléchi, euh, qui va être réfléchi, réfléchi euh, euh, par le fond. Donc, il, y a, oui, il, faudrait, il faudrait, faire des, faudrait faire des estimations, en fait. Est-ce que d'autres personnes souhaitent poser euh, des questions On a encore peut-être deux, trois minutes pour prendre une ou deux questions. Oui, s'il n'y a pas d'autres questions, euh, moi, j'en aurais une. Est-ce que vous avez essayé d'utiliser, de, de, euh, euh, déterminer un, un algorithme pour estimer KD avec les données euh, Landsat ou Sentinel-2. Euh, ouais. Avez-vous fait des, des tentatives à ce niveau-là? Euh, oui. Enfin, euh, à, partir de, à partir de Landsat, donc ça, c'est une image de Landsat, en fait, pour le KD. Et bon, tu peux voir les, tu peux voir les, euh, bon, les algorithmes. Bon, je sais pas pas pour finir la, la slide, mais euh, ça, c'est des données qui, en fait, euh, c'est pas toutes les données qu'on a là, mais c'est les données de 2018-2019, et aussi ça inclut des données qui sont sur la côte, là, plus dans les eaux, euh, dans plus eaux larges. Et bon, tu vois comme bon, simple, simple Ben ratio, ok, pour le pour le KD dans les UV, euh, dans le bleu et puis aussi dans, dans le vert, on, on est capable d'avoir des assez bonnes mesures. Euh, 
Euh, là, je te montre un peu une, une image que, sur laquelle on a appliqué ces algorithmes pour le KD340 dans le système. Euh, et le problème, c'est que, bon, toujours avoir des, des données après, atmosphère, action, après euh, correction atmosphérique qui soient euh, toujours bonnes et consistantes, dans ce système, ce n'est pas toujours facile. Et euh, des fois, ça marche bien et des fois, ça ne marche pas bien. <rire> et euh, on n'a pas fait de… Bon, on, a, on a essayé différents algorithmes, euh, euh, différentes euh, euh, corrections atmosphériques. Euh, bon, on en vient toujours à la même conclusion que bon, certaines marchent mieux dans certains cas, mais ça marche mais il n'y en a pas qui marchent partout, tout le temps très bien. Donc, euh, bon, évidemment, on a une image comme ça une fois tous les, tous les mois peut-être. Euh, donc, c'est peut-être peut euh, euh, quelque chose qu'on peut utiliser pour, pour peut-être valider le modèle, mais bon, en, tant, en tant que comprendre la dynamique du KD là-dedans, bon, c'est un peu plus difficile. Oui, absolument. C'est vrai que l'image qui est présentée à la fin de ta présentation, euh, c'est les blades qui vont d'un côté et de l'autre. Est-ce que c'est une expérience que vous avez en cours, ça? Non, 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 non. Non, euh, non c'est quelque chose qu'il faudrait que... Bon, qu on... bon là, on, on finit cette première, ce, ce premier travail, mais cela, ce serait quelque chose à faire, euh, à faire ensuite, quoi. Euh, pour pouvoir un peu améliorer ça. Ça me semble que John Headley... Euh... <rire> Uh, kind of, uh, people would be, uh, pour aider uh, là-dessus, mais ce n'est pas, pas quelque chose qu'on a fait encore, c'est juste quelque chose qu'on qu a besoin de considérer uh, pour améliorer ça. Ce n'est pas l'expérience que vous êtes en train de faire? Là. Non, non, non. Okay. Ça serait bien, mais bon, pour l'instant, on essaie de finir, <rire> essaie de finir dire le premier truc. Bien, s'il n'y euh, si a pas d'autres questions, euh, on va libérer euh, Cédric euh, et le laisser vaquer à ses autres occupations. Encore, euh, merci beaucoup Cédric pour euh, ta super présentation. Merci à tous et bonne journée. Merci à tous.